and welcome to this episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW LP Brattleboro 107.7 FM, your community radio station. I am your host, Olga Peters, and for those who are new to the show, this is where Representative Emily Kornheiser and I talk about how things in Montpelier shake out for Wyndham County. And lately, we have been talking a lot about COVID-19. And today, we will be talking about COVID-19 and housing with, I'm very excited, Maura Collins from the Vermont Housing Finance Agency, which you will also be, you will also hear it called the VHFA. And uh, Maura has been on the show before to talk about housing, but now we're kind of in a whole new world, but not. Um, so welcome, Emily, and welcome, Maura. So glad you are both here today. Thank you so much for having me back. And just a quick disclaimer to everyone. We have two that we have to say. One is that the um, opinions on the show are ours and not the radio stations. And the second one is it is now summer. All of a sudden, it is summer and my window is open, my fans are on. Uh, Maura has lost power, so she's on her back deck. Um, you may, who knows what we're going to hear today. So you have been warned. <laughs> um, I wanna start Emily and, and Maura with, with just um, some information from a housing needs assessment study that came out from, and, and the VHFA was one of the, the partners on this study. Um, looking at housing in Vermont, and this report I don't think got a lot of traction, Maura, unfortunately, uh, because it came out in February of 2020, and we know what happened right after that. But I wanted to refer to that report because it talks about the needs we had in Vermont for housing before COVID. And some of the the findings I found interesting in this study was that um, before 2010, the number of homes in Vermont were increasing, basically. And now there's been a stagnation in recent years and looking forward to 2025, there's been this stagnation in the housing market as far as new homes. Is that correct, Maura? Yes, it is. I th we talked a little about this last time I was on your show, and uh, we're seeing this across the state, um, and it's hitting southern Vermont especially hard, where, yes, we used to produce a lot more housing than we do now, and that uh, drying up of creating new units has a lot of reasons. Um, it's more expensive to build now. There's more that we require of what we build now. Uh, energy efficiency, for instance, uh, community connections, that these are wonderful things that happen when you create a neighborhood or build a home is that you're putting in rec pads and sidewalks and lots of other amenities. It does also add to the cost of housing. And so we're seeing uh, as that burden shifts from municipalities providing those services to home builders providing those services, uh, the cost goes on to the price of homes and we're seeing those cost of housing go up and, and the construction go down, which is really putting a, a cramp on our already tight housing markets where there's low vacancies already. And, and I also found it was interesting um, because we have been talking a lot on the show about seasonal rentals, whether it's a family a second home or like a short-term rental, we usually think of Airbnb or home away for short-term rentals, but we're seeing that kind of housing stock used for that increasing. Um, and it's interesting in, in Wyndham County, Wyndham County has the highest rate of seasonal home ownership. Um, it's about 33% where owner, like home ownership is 45% of the rental market and, or sorry, the housing market and rental units are about 22 percent of the market so seasonal homes are right up there in Wyndham County um, which which I also found interesting and then the other thing I found interesting Maura if you can touch on it is that there's the demand for what is called service enriched housing 
um, is also going up. So I'm kind of wondering, just so we can get a lay of the land before COVID, this need for services, an increase in seasonal homes, and a stagnation in new housing, like how do those three pieces fit together? Like what's the net outcome of that? If that's not too big a question. No, it, it is a big question and it's a daunting um, dilemma that we face. And when I say dilemma, it sounds academic, but it really is what individuals are facing every day is they either try to make Vermont their home or uh, are struggling to, to get some permanency in Vermont. Um, Vermont and Maine always long standing for, for many, many decades have traded being the number one state for having the largest proportion of our homes are seasonal homes. And so I think right now we're second behind Maine and by the 2020 census, maybe we'll be back to number one. But um, Southern Vermont is where we really see a high preponderance of vacation homes. It, they very much, there's not a lot in Chittenden County, but Southern Vermont um, is really attracting a lot of those Boston, New York, um, folks who want to New Jersey uh, come up and and have this be their weekend getaway so we can immediately start to draw strong connections about what does that mean now in light of COVID so we already had a lot of people calling Vermont as their second home and we saw news articles this week from both VPR and Vermont Digger around how southern Vermont especially is having people uh, not be able to travel to Vermont to see homes that they want to purchase, but buying them sight unseen for their asking price, sometimes cash offers. This is really going to shift to the Southern Vermont housing market in ways that we couldn't even uh, report on in the housing needs assessment that we just finished in February. So in some ways, that report is already going to be out of date. But I have good news for all the data nerds who are trying to hear these stats and figures and, and take notes about it. The housing needs assessment um, this year really built off of a housing data website platform that VHFA created 20 years ago. And all the data on the needs assessment is available at the town level um, for all communities across Vermont where you can look at how many seasonal homes are in my town, how many short-term rentals are in my town, which we just launched yesterday, that data piece. Um, what, that is so exciting. I it's know, right? so <laughs> exciting. And so I just, I have so much to say, so I don't want to talk too long, but I'm just going to keep going on a rant of saying that housingdata.org, you can pull up these community profiles and see how you compare to other neighborhoods around you, other counties, uh, how you compare to the statewide average. And it really starts to show the unique housing pressures in each part of the state. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, Southern Vermont especially, um, Wyndham County has so many seasonal homes. That's a long-standing reality. And so what I think a lot of us in housing are thinking about now is, how does that long-standing reality of having all these seasonal homes impact, going to be impacted by COVID, will those people who called Vermont their second home flip flop that and now have Vermont be their primary residence if they have access to broadband and they can work from safe bucolic Vermont where there's very low incidence of, of COVID and then have maybe their city place be their weekend place that they go to eat out and, and do their recreating there. And that's something we'll that we've that. talked about before on the show in that that sort of Vermont has built you know, it's been a hundred years of Vermont being sort of the apocalypse home for people um, through various, you know, iterations through the Vietnam War, um, through the Great Depression, whatever it is, of people who have, you know, some connection to Vermont, perhaps because of a family vacation home, when they realize that, you know, what they're facing in city life, whether that is sort of, you know, the middle class grind or a pandemic or a war, whatever it is, they come here hoping for something better. And so we've especially built up Wyndham County based on those cultural floods of people. And so when people in Vermont or even people outside of Vermont say, oh, Vermont's so like Brattleboro and Wyndham County are so like cute and crafty and there's so much art and all of that stuff. A lot of that is because we've been, you know, flooded 
over and over and over again by people building second homes and putting their money and their cultural energy into that. And so that's, I don't want us to think of this as a new phenomenon. What I'm worried about is that we were already at a tipping point economically around it. And the class divide that happens because of that is enormous. And one of the ways we've been able to justify um, in some ways sort of like selling our cultural capital as a tourism home, a second home, is that folks with second homes pay much higher taxes than folks you know, with homesteads. Um, and so when that flips, that also won't be true. I, yeah, I, I, there is something about um, that one of the themes people keep asking me what's happening with housing in relation to COVID and what's going to happen with the crystal ball. And I just keep wanting to say to everyone, all the issues and the problems and the opportunities and, and capital that we have pre-COVID are, are still here and still at play. Yeah. So we had food insecurity. We, ha we now still have food insecurity and it's mm -hmm. worse. We had a housing crunch. We still have a housing crunch and it's going to get worse. Um, we have limited access to broadband. That is only going to get worse as people need and see what a lifeline and, and utility that that is. And so it's not like the world has changed for us. It's that everything has just been exacerbated. Mm -hmm. And so I think in addition to the cracks being widened, which is sort of the phrase we've been using over and over again here, we also have a lot more people with eyes on it, right? We see a lot more people... Um, talking about food insecurity because they actually see the lines, right, in people lining up to get the National Guard meals. Or um, we know that everyone was housed in at least Wyndham County for perhaps the first time in Vermont history. Um, and so, or we hear, you know, about the second home floods or whatever it is, but we're, we have so many more people aware. We have so many more legislators doing constituent service around people who are really struggling financially. And so we have this tremendous opportunity to really be mindful about how we're gonna take those lessons of the cracks and sort of step into this next, step into the future. And I wanna add to that, you know, as we're talking about like the statistics of Wyndham County, who owns a home, who rents, who has a seasonal home, I, I I also want to bring that concept of balance. Like it's not good or bad if someone owns or if they rent or if it's seasonal, it's about the balance within the community and, and where the cost burdens are. Because one thing I think the um, report also found that I forgot about is that um, there's a, a high number of Vermonters who are cost burdened by their housing, meaning more than 30% of their income goes to rent and or mortgage, utilities, insurance, you know, keeping a roof over their head. Um, and so I think what we're seeing too with COVID and these widening cracks is we were already playing kind of Jenga or don't tip the waiter. <laughs> and, and yeah, now things are really flopping one way or the other. Um, and I like what you said, Emily, about more eyes on it. Um, I wonder if both of you could touch uh, talk about um, the the fact that at least in Wyndham County we did have everybody housed who have who have been chronically homeless or had very insecure housing. Um, I know a number on on May twenty second a number of housing service organizations reached out to the legislature and said, "Hey, this is an amazing opportunity. Let's let's make sure it stays forever." Um, and becomes the new normal. Um, can either of you talk to that? And are there things moving through the legislature right now or efforts to, to try to, to keep those who have been housed, keep them housed? That was well, I very gracious. Speak, <laughs> I can speak from the um, maybe advocate's point of view as a houser and then maybe Representative Kornheiser can speak to more, you know, what what it's like from the legislature and the what you all are weighing. Um, Wyndham County is not alone. It, it, it was wonderful that it happened there. It's wonderful that it happened statewide. We ended homelessness in Vermont. Like, and, and that's still true today. For another couple days, you know, we can rest easy knowing that all Vermonters are housed in safe housing, meaning that 
the congregate based shelters, the system that we typically rely on, which could mean in, in a city or, or a, more of our bigger communities could mean 20, 30 people in bunk beds in one congregate room or staying in a shelter. Exactly. That that was clearly the state acted decisively and quickly and did the right thing in making sure that that did not continue and moved folks into state funded hotels and motels. And that saved lives. And that, as far as I know, there was one COVID positive case in the homeless community. Uh, and that person did not pass away. I don't know anything more than that. But that is a tremendous um, uh, outcome because in other states we are seeing rampant COVID cases that just goes through shelters the way we fear it will go through nursing homes and other congregate settings. And so uh, that was again decisive, quick action on the state's part, and the agency Human Services deserves a lot of credit to at what they did um, uh, in unprecedented times. And now, so we're, okay, everyone's housed, but we know that the hotels and motels are not going to remain um, permanent housing forever for everyone. They need to go back to their typical business models. And so in doing that, what happens next? And that's what the state's grappling with. And there was some time that housing advocates, funders, the Agency of Human Services, um, the State Department of Housing, uh, a lot of us were all working together on a plan of reimagining homelessness and what would a new system of care look like if it did not um, just warehouse people in shelters, but instead really looked at moving people into apartments immediately and then providing those wraparound services and the rental assistance that would make them successful in the long term. Then the realities of the fiscal pressures became more clear. And uh, now that that window shade is closing on this opportunity, it looks like in many ways. And so one of the one of the bright lights and the opportunities was the idea of using this coronavirus relief fund, which I always call CRF for coronavirus relief fund. This $1.25 billion from the feds that came out of the CARES Act um, that was just manna from heaven of, of money for states to be able to um, respond to their COVID needs. Incredibly and, restricted manna from heaven. And yes. that's exactly it. And then, you know, when we, you know, $1.25 billion made our eyes sparkle. And then when you read the small print and found out that the money all had to be spent by December 30th, we realized that um, in communities where there, there's adequate housing and there's just some rental assistance needed, then there's some real opportunities to, um, to house people. But this rental assistance is going to be needed after December 30th. Some of these social services to support people will be needed after December 30th. And there's communities like in Brattleboro where there's not enough housing units and building a whole bunch of homes physically, the structures by December 30th is going to be tough, especially when a construction industry has been shut down and is now just slowly waking up. And so I don't want to end, before I pass it off to Emily, I don't want to end um, on a sour note though, because there are opportunities. There is this network of um, mostly nonprofit affordable housing providers who stand ready and willing to um, meet the needs of folks. And we've identified between 200 and 300 units, apartments across the state that we could access well before December 30th um, and move some of these folks who are homeless into these apartments and provide them with that rental assistance and services. And so we're looking right now at just what can we do in the next six months, but then we also need to have that um, longer vision and game plan for what will we be doing in 2021 because these folks who are in hotels now and will slowly be moving back to shelters and other settings are going to still need housing even after the CRF money may expire. Mm -hmm. So there are some proposals on the table around ways to sort of increase the housing stock. And those proposals, the proposals that came out of the governor's administration um, put a real emphasis on both housing rehab 
and um, rent subsidies. And rent subsidies is sort of um, short-term rent subsidies for folks who are just struggling to pay rent right now and keep people housed is a separate conversation that I want to have, but I, um, it's separate from housing homeless people. It's about preventing homelessness. Um, and so the rehab, which has been a, was a proposal um, before COVID hit and it's just sort of been re, repackaged for COVID times, um, is help, really helpful in some areas. It's really helpful in the Rutland area. It's really helpful in the Bennington area. It's really helpful in St. Johnsbury area. I always have to like imagine the map to do St. Johnsbury and St. Albans. Um, where it's not very helpful is Wyndham County. We, yes, there are some units that could be rehabbed, um, but not anywhere near um, as many as we need. We have at least 100 people who right now, today, are host, housed in motels on state money receiving social service receiving services from groundworks we don't have anywhere near that many units we've for the last many years at least four we've had folks who had housing vouchers could pay for units and could not find anywhere to live at all and often had to send their vouchers back so the problem isn't even the services in the short term or the money for the housing in the short term it's actually just the units and so in our county, when I think about what steps, next steps need to be that will work for us, which is very different from the administration's proposal on the table, it's really about maintaining this transitional living in a much more humane way than we have while we do the long-term investments to really build. And so that's looking at what one of the proposals on the table from the housing advocates, not from the administration, is to send this money to communities so that they can adapt it to their particular needs. And in our community, that would really look like buying a motel, which is a huge, would be a way to have a huge outlay of money, meaning that we could spend the money before December 31st, which is how soon we have to spend the money. We could keep people with beds and doors and privacy so that they would have addresses and could, you know, live their lives and get jobs and you know take care of themselves and their families and um which is just incredibly hard to do when you don't know where you're sleeping every night and you have to pack up all your stuff and um, i'm not going to get too deep into the incredible stress and hopelessness of not having somewhere to sleep um so if we could do that those folks would um we'd have long-term temporary shelter for people, which is very different from the seasonal shelters, which are both temporary in terms of you can't stay there during the day and they're not available in the summer and all kinds of other things. And then those folks would still be eligible for the longer term housing vouchers, because if we house them right now in a permanent location, they're not eligible for the um, federal housing vouchers, which we actually have more of than we're using right now. Mm -hmm. And so if we could extend, we could buy those motels with the money, find the state money to provide the, the wraparound services in the long term, which is less than providing the housing in the long term, it's just the services, then we could really start turning the curve. We would have sort of a second level response while we work on, um, say, the endless challenge of bonding so that VHFA could really help us, you know, with the funding to build permanent long-term housing, expand our housing stock so that maybe our rental market could get a little less um, completely overwrought with what it is now. Um, it's too tight for people to even be let in the door of looking mm -hmm. at places right now. And so that's my hope in a combination from the proposals because what we're seeing on the table is this one size fits all. And Wyndham County, especially Brattleboro and Chittenden are in very, very similar challenges with their housing stock. But Chittenden actually has like some private investment that's interested, um, has much more robust um, ability to raise funds and services. Um, it's a different dynamic and has a lot more, you know, representation in the legislature. Um, whereas outside of sort of in rural Vermont, which is what we still are here in Brattleboro, um, we're the only area that has that sort of tightness in our housing market, from what I understand. Other places need the rehab. We just need new stock. Um, and part of that is because a lot of our existing housing stock um, is sitting vacant. Um, one other proposal that keeps on floating around, and I know I've been talking for a while here, um, which is fascinating and um, 
I don't think a long-term solution, but I want to name it, is some folks have been saying, well, we have all these vacant Airbnbs. Maybe all of the homeless folks can move into the vacant Airbnbs. Um, but if the folks who ran the Airbnbs wanted homeless folks to be living in their Airbnbs, they would have done that five years ago. They wouldn't have become Airbnb units. They would have become rental units. Like there's a there's an essential, um, almost like aesthetic decision there that has already been made and is not going to change. And that's, that is what it is. Um, but I, it's a, I don't think it's a useful road to walk down for solving mm -hmm. this problem. And that's one of the um, findings that we highlight in the housing needs assessment to go back to what Olga, where we started the conversation. Um, we have a whole chapter on talking about the housing stock in Vermont. And there's a section on short-term rentals because this is an emerging uh, trend in our marketplace over the last several years. And um, that on average, when you look at what uh, rental prices are in Vermont and you look at what we know people can get for a nightly rate with a short-term rental, it only takes five nights of a short-term rental uh, being occupied to make more than you would as a rental unit month long. And with being a, a permanent rental uh, apartment, you have landlord tenant laws, you have you know, a lot of extra um, work that goes into that and, and risk and obligation. And now maybe you need to evict someone and there's a lot of risk and cost to that that isn't in place when you just have the risk of oh, someone may, you know, lightly trash my place one night, but, you know, how much can they do in one night as opposed to how much can happen in a month and so, or a year? And um, so that, that economics comes into that decision as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Maura. Thank you, Emily. If you're just joining us, this is the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7, your Brattleboro community radio station. We need to go to break to hear from some of our underwriters, but we shall be back in a moment. So stay tuned and see you on the, uh, not the flip side, but I guess after the break. There we go. Welcome back to the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WBEW LP 107.7 FM, Brattleboro, your local community radio station. As always, the opinions expressed on this show are the opinions of the host and the guests and the regular contributor and not the radio station. If you are just joining us, I am speaking with Representative Emily Kornheiser, who is one of the representatives for Brattleboro, as well as Maura Collins, who is the Executive Director of the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. Welcome back. Ha, huh. so one of the things that I'm feeling very excited about in our conversation right now around housing and um, homelessness is that while COVID has made things harder in many ways around housing, and we're going to talk about some of the issues it created in a moment here, the other thing I'm finding exciting is that we as a state have proved to ourselves that we can solve some of these big problems. Like we were talking before the break, we at statewide at least for the time of COVID, solved homelessness. And that was something I think beforehand, a lot of people said, well, it's always gonna be here. There's nothing we can do about it. And we proved that yes, with decisive action and coordinated action and funding, we can do it. So that to me is exciting because we are proving new things to ourselves. That said, it sounds like we're going to have to keep proving things to ourselves because one thing that we dealt with as a community and as a state is as people, um, as the economy shut down and people started staying home, people's finances were impacted. I think impacted heavily would probably be an understatement. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the, the issues that arose for many people is how am I going to pay my rent? How am I going to pay my mortgage? Um, and one thing the state did was pause evictions. Is that correct, Emily? Mm -hmm. um, first, the courts paused evictions in a very um, haphazard 
way, essentially. It was not consistent throughout the state. And so then the legislature stepped in and um, officially paused them throughout the state. So what does that mean right now? Like, where are we right now around um, evictions? And what's the next step? We're still under an emergency order pausing evictions. And then for 45 days, is it 45? Okay, I keep on, people keep on saying 30 and my memory of the legislation was 45 days. 45 days after the lifting of the emergency order, um, evictions will still be paused. But then after that, free flowing. And so I don't, you know, if you've ever fallen behind on rent, falling behind even a little bit on rent is a very, very, very hard thing to ever catch up on. Um, I would say even harder than credit card payments, my personal <laughs> experience of falling behind on various bills. And so, and the, m for most people, the income challenges that led them to fall behind on rent are not necessarily going to be solved tomorrow. There's a few people who had huge back payments from the Department of Labor for unemployment insurance that fell behind then got a huge payment, were able to catch up. But for most people, the time of missed employment is not going to be filled back in. And so there's still a hole in how in people's finances, the majority, the vast, vast, vast majority of Vermonters and Americans don't have any savings. Um, certainly not enough savings to cover an entire month's rent. And so we have all of these people that are have back rent, have been building up back rent and maybe even haven't even started to seek services yet for how to fill in that hole in order to um, pay their back rent, which we, they're still gonna owe at the end of this fiction stay. One, um, one interesting piece of this all to me and um, of sort of the widening of the cracks and COVID is that we're seeing a lot of people who are um, newly poor or newly poorer who haven't accessed the sort of standard services for folks who are um, struggling deeply on a daily basis, usually in Vermont. So um, we have a lot of people with, you know, food instability who have not accessed food stamps before, um, and a lot of people with housing instability who have not accessed their community actions or their housing agencies before. And so as we solve this problem, I want to be really careful that we're investing in existing services rather than building a parallel system between the old poor and the new poor, which is this where the direction we seem to be going with the food security system right now. And um, I am really nervous that that's also what we're going to do with um, housing security. Yeah, Laura, I think can you comment. Yeah, um, I mean, this is an issue that I spend all my days and nights thinking about. Um, I want to be very clear that as a um, mortgage lender to rental housing properties, um, you know, I, like most, I, I want people to pay their rent. When they pay their rent, then uh, their landlord can pay their mortgage. And when their mortgage is with VHFA, um, we can then pay our bond investors who we promised to pay when we issued a bond eight, 10 years ago. Um, and bonds, as you know, are very safe investments. And so there's, there's no ability for us to not pay those investors back. And so that flow is important to our economy in that way. Um, that being said, as Representative Kornheiser just laid out, that there's no way through this if your job has been cut, eliminated, your hours reduced, you know, and your business has closed, um, and so there's no way to pay that rent. And so the, the actions Ooh. of the legislature are to hold off and not worsen our public health crisis and having people become homeless during this time. Um, so I will say that the affordable housing community has been um, happily surprised that rent collections have not been as bad as we thought. In March, we were thinking the sky was going to absolutely fall April 1st, and it didn't. And then we, we started scratching down deeper, and it, and it made sense because mm -hmm. in affordable housing, you have people with rental subsidies like Section 8. You have people living on fixed incomes. You have a lot of elders. Elders' incomes didn't always change because they were already living on a fixed income like Social Security or pensions that um, didn't change with their employment status. And the third so, category is you have a lot of essential workers. 
Exactly. Right? You have a lot of people providing home health care, exactly. you, right? You have a lot of people working at groceries. And so. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And so those folks, as we know, are the backbone upon which our economy rests. And so we had a lot of people who may be getting overtime hours, you know, because they were um, working on the front lines in that way. Custodians, you know, cleaning and things like that. So in some ways, the affordable housing folks, again, it's not great. I don't want to add, it's rent collections are, are um, down, the receivables are way down, and, and um, it is a problem, but it's not as bad as we anticipated. What keeps me up at night is that we know, and we, and we verified again in that housing needs assessment we were talking about before, that over 75% of people who are eligible based on their income for affordable housing don't live in affordable housing, mm -hmm. don't get that benefit. We do not have a right to housing in this state. We have, we have other inalienable rights, but housing's not one of them unless you are incarcerated. And so uh, what, what's happening is that we know that 75% of people who are low income and should be eligible for housing assistance don't get it because we don't have enough resources in this state or federally coming from the feds uh, to support them. And so those folks are the ones who I'm especially concerned about. Yes. And uh, so I, I do give a lot of credit. I think it's a wonderful first step what the administration has put out mm -hmm. in terms of spending um, $50 million of the coronavirus relief fund money on uh, homelessness prevention in this way and back rent and some short term rental assistance is a great first step to support people for the next six months. And so the, the timing is important. The quicker we can get this through the legislature and this program um, going, the less in a hole these households are gonna be. And uh, if we can support them through December, that's going to be great. And maybe we can support them so that they end up um, with not a lot extra, but just a little extra so that they can get through then January and February. Um, so often with these programs, we look at the very least amount we can provide people. And if we could really help people build back where they were before coronavirus started and maybe a little savings, maybe, you know, a cushion and, and be okay with their rent, then that kind of stability could get us through the winter, which I know we're all concerned about as, you know, cold and flu season will be upon us again in another few months. So there's a few, because there's a few places that we might have expected an immediate crisis to occur that didn't. So one of them is what Maura described that um, affordable housing, folks who were already in affordable housing were for the most part okay through this. And then we have the fact that tax return, this happened at the same time that a lot of people get their tax returns, sort of um, folks with slightly more income than folks in affordable housing, but folks who are still don't necessarily have savings. Tax returns came in. There was the Trump tax cut credit, whatever that check was. There was the check that came in the mail with the dollars in it. Um, and so those were cash infusions for people that the might. Unemployment, the extra unemployment money has been huge. That yes. has saved so many people. The extra unemployment money, if people got it, um, was huge. That's going to end fairly soon. And so we had these pieces of money that um, helped. And then we have folks who, um, and then some of those folks might have had a little bit of savings or some family connections. And so that brought people into sort of a safety and stability maybe until now maybe another two or three months. Um, but then the crisis is going to hit because the economy is not getting better anytime soon. And so as it reopens, it will reopen. It's not going to be, we're not going to return to the past times. We are going to return to a, we're going to move into a new time. Um, and so all of those folks who, again, I don't think have access resources, social services in a long time or perhaps ever, are going to need to figure out new ways to do that and we're going to need to make it possible for them to know that that's an okay thing to do which is very different from the existing social service system which is really designed for people who are familiar with it it's one of the reasons the department of labor situation was so dire was because we had people who are sort of walking the gauntlet of state service provision that hadn't done it before and didn't know the secret language or the secret workarounds or it's, you know, it's all insider language, that stuff. Um, and so 
that's where that's where I'm concerned. And I want to make sure that we're communicating to our community that it is okay to ask for help. You did not do anything wrong for this to be happening to you. Society did it to you. You did not do it to you. And we are here to do something about it because it matters to everyone in the community that people stay housed. Um, and so to really make those benefits much more open um, and available to people who might not have sought them before so we don't have a whole new um, class and group of folks who are without housing. Mm -hmm. And um, Maura, what, and, and maybe Emily can uh, touch on this too, because uh, I think Emily, you were the one who said, let's, let's work on existing programs, let's not necessarily create new ones. So for folks who may not be um, uh, familiar with, with some of the programs that Vermont offers, I'm curious, what is on offer? And even though you said, let's not create new programs, I'm wondering if there's some places where we do need to create new safety nets. Does that make sense? Yeah, the, um, there is, <laughs> Emily was just saying, a complicated world of housing programs that um, a handful of people understand and the rest of folks, um, you know, struggle to understand. And, and we don't make this easy as housers. We have too many acronyms, too many eligibility guidelines. Uh, we, for instance, I don't talk about income in terms of dollars per hour that someone may earn or even your annual salary. I always talk about it as what percentage of the area's median income do you earn? And if you, if you can tell me that, then I can tell you what program you qualify for. We'll talk about a metric that no one in the world understands and knows. So, so we have not made this easy um, for folks. And then uh, you have things like benefit cliffs. You have things that um, uh, come into play when someone makes just a little more income that all of a sudden may make them ineligible. And so, um, some of the programs that have been uh, working really well and that we'd like to really double down on at a time like this because they're known systems are to rely on the network of affordable housing providers who operate across the state in different regions. In the Brattleboro area, we think of the Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust. We also think of the Brattleboro Housing Authority. There's the Springfield Housing Authority and the State Housing Authority. Um, they are these organizations that are dedicated to serving um, the housing needs of lower income folks in the community. And they can do that in a, a lot of different ways. Sometimes it's just that rental assistance that someone needs, that Section 8 voucher, and there has been federal money to bolster that program, which is great, and so much more is needed. Um, there's also, you know, as we talked about before, the need to access the unit to actually find the apartments and the homes. And that can be what is the hardest nut to crack in the Brattleboro area. Um, and then we've talked about the availability of services that some households may need. Some folks who are homeless, they're homeless for um, an economic reason that may be short term and with a bit of back rent, like we talked about with the administration's proposal, that could get them back on their feet and in a good place and stable because it was an economic crisis. It was the economic crisis of COVID that caused their homelessness. And as the economy hopefully rebounds, um, although I think we're being very naive about what that looks like uh, right now, that th they may be okay. Uh, a lot of um, the programs that really need bolstering and support are the existing programs that braid together those three legs of the stool that are necessary of the actual supply of housing, the subsidy to make it affordable, and the services to really support the households if they need it. Thank you, Maura. Do you so, want to add anything, Emily? Yeah, um, one of the interesting things about the way Vermont does business is that so much of sort of public services are provisioned privately through nonprofits, and we've talked about this a lot here on the happy hour. Um, and often those services are sort of given to a specific um, 
class of organizations in each county. Um, sometimes they're called designated, you know, in the mental health world, it's called a designated agency. With early childhood, it's parent child centers. But the actual nonprofit that does that work is a different nonprofit in each county with its own board, its own functioning, and its own skill set. And so the um, payment for back rent, sort of subsidies and support around back rent usually goes through the community action agencies. And each community action agency in the area is different from every other and has different skills and different capacity and different relationships to their community. But they're all connected um, to other housing providers, both homeless service providers and housing, low-income housing providers like the Housing Brattleboro Housing Partnership and Wind and Windsor Housing Trust in a system called Coordinated Entry. Um, and it's actually a table that everyone comes and sits at on a regular basis, talks about systemic problems and sort of immediate case issues, and gives sort of a no wrong door system for folks who are seeking services. So that people don't have to be sort of referred from A to B to C to D to back to B in order to get their needs met, which is really, really important. One, because it gives us consistent data across the system. Two, it helps us highlight where the cracks are. And three, most importantly to me, like people don't have to walk this like terrible gauntlet maze situation in order to get their needs met when they're already confused and stressed. And so I wanna be really careful that, you know, as new people are starting to enter the system, that they're gonna have a no wrong door, that they're gonna have people who say yes to them yes, we'll figure this out with you, and um, sort of partnerships in their community. So I think it's really important that as we deliver those housing subsidies to communities, even though it seems like just a little bit of a contract tweak, that it goes through our coordinated entry system and not just to one provider, because I think people seek services based on relationships, especially if they haven't sought those services before. Yeah, I'm really optimistic, Emily. It I agree with you that that should be the goal. I love the coordinated entry system. I wish it were more <laughs> really underlining your point of um, the unevenness that we see in different parts of the state. Um, I wish it were more consistently strong across the state. You're right that in Wyndham County, you guys are doing a great job in that regard. I, that's not the case statewide, which really concerns me as a statewide entity. Um, and so, but um, one thing I'm optimistic about is that the, uh, right now we know what the state wants to do with the coronavirus relief funds as it relates to the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. They were the first department to come out with um, their solution from the administration of, um, of how to spend this money. And it focuses on uh, the funding needed for small businesses on tourism and marketing and on housing, because those are the departments that fall under the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. We are still waiting to hear from the Agency of Human Services about what their plan is. So as we talked earlier about the 2000 Vermonters who are living in hotels and motels and watching every day we wake up and the calendar flips another page of the day and we know that we're getting closer to a time when those hotels and motels won't be available, the Agency of Human Services is very actively working on their plan to transition people out of those hotels and into something different. And I don't have any insider knowledge of what's coming, but having listened to the testimony of um, the Agency of Human Services so far, it's clear that they are going to be investing heavily in housing navigation services. And so that's getting at what you were talking about, Emily, I hope of that no wrong door that really, um, putting money into helping people access housing in a way that maybe historically hasn't been needed because there's so many new people uh, who need this money. So in, so I don't know um, what AHS's plan is going to be. I'm told that it'll be available, I hope in another week, maybe. I mean, I think they're, it's very, um, it's at the top of uh, what they're working on. They, uh, this is their top priority. Uh, and I think it's going to go towards the kind of things you're talking about, which, which would be good because that is needed. 
So we have just about five minutes left and I know Maura needs to get to another meeting. So I wanna to touch base with, with both of you. We've, we've pulled on an awful lot of threads here uh, around housing in Vermont, what existed before, the, the issues that existed before, what COVID kind of shook up and, and what we're looking at in the long haul. So what do you think is the most important thing for people to understand right now, Maura, about what we need as far as housing in Vermont, um, whether it's funding, whether it's new stock, whatever, what, what do you feel is really important for people to understand about the need? I think we need strong leadership who can act quickly. I think that too much time has already passed and I'm very concerned about this closing window of the federal dollars that have to be spent by December 30th. We had a real opportunity to transform our homeless delivery system and because of uh, funding limitations, we're not going to, well, people have chosen that we will not be um, uh, transforming that system in the way that was possible. and. Um, and so what we do need is for strong leaders to act quickly to start moving us towards something then. If we can't close all our homeless shelters and give everyone an apartment the way they deserve, then we at least need to have a clear, decisive plan of what we're going to do for these 2,000 Vermonters who are in hotels only for another couple weeks. And there are, as we spoke to before, several um, proposals out there, strong ones with broad-based support by all the nonprofit regional housing providers, the public housing authorities, the shelter and community action agencies. They've all signed on to these letters supporting this kind of uh, movement to give us an answer of what we can be doing because we are all ready to activate. We are standing at the starting blocks of a race you know, with our butts in the air, just ready for that gun to go off. And we have been training for this our whole lives. Like we are ready. We have resources to deploy partnerships, collaborations, the kind of uh, wonderful work that's been happening in Brailboro between the Groundwork Collaborative and um, Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust and the police department and the municipal leaders and all this. I mean, we are poised for action. We just need someone to tell us that it's time to go. And so with that sort of signal, I feel like we can unleash wonderful things to help a lot of our vulnerable Vermonters. But without that, we're all just sitting there with our butts in the air, getting tired. Thank you, Maura. How about you, Emily? What do you think is really key for people to, to take away from this conversation? I don't think I could say it any better than Maura just did. We we need to make decisions and we need to make those decisions based on what we are seeing in front of us to be the stark reality of our lives in Vermont. And we have solvable problems that we could just say, yes, we're going to solve them tomorrow and move forward. It's very rarely this clear in politics. And today it is, and yet we're still seeing um, some debilitating indecision in a lot of places of power and we need to we need to move forward and say that we believe in Vermonters and we believe in our capacity to solve our problems here and we have the resources to do it for the first time. Well thank you. On that note I want to thank Emily of course for being uh, the regular contributor and being here every week for the highlight of the happy week. hour. Yes yes um, and Maura Collins from the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. Thank you so much for being on the show and sticking with it even when you've lost power and your neighbor is mowing their lawn next door and all your allergies are, are working overtime because of the, the flying, flying grass, I guess is a way to put it. I want to thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Maura. Thank you so much. The Montpelier Happy Hour will be back next week on WVEW LP Brattleboro 107.7 FM at 2 p.m. on Friday. You can also find us on the Vermontitude SoundCloud page and the Vermontitude Facebook page. Emily, quickly just remind people where your open meetings are, your office hours, and how to, how to reach you. 
Every Saturday morning at 9 a.m., I am hosting an open Zoom coffee hour session with the two other reps from Brattleboro, Tristan Tolino and Molly Burke. Folks can find contact information for that on my Facebook page under Emily Kornheiser or on French Porch Forum or various other places it's floating around. Um, or get in touch with me at ekornheiser.org or ekornheiser at ledge.state.vt.us. You can also find me on Twitter or Instagram. And more, just quickly remind us where people can find the, the new housing data. That yeah, it's a great resource. So it's a website through the Vermont Housing Finance Agency, but the um, web address for the housing needs assessment and all that great housing data is at housingdata.org. So you can find information, like I said, for every village, every town, county, and statewide, and there's hundreds of uh, data visualizations, which is what nerds call charts, um, that give you all sorts of um, housing market information and information about the population and their housing needs. It is, I have long thought that it is the best data site in the state for any information. So I really encourage folks to go check it out. It is easy to access, fun. I know that you're about to relaunch it, but. Yeah, no, we, um, we did, we relaunched it. We also just added a page that may be of interest to people called Pandemic Economic Indicators. And we have a whole series of these charts that look and are measuring um, our unemployment rate, but also looking at the labor participation in the most at-risk industries, um, for instance, tourism and hospitality and other ones I'm blanking on that will be, um, disproportionately impacted by when our economy closes and opens um, either what just happened or if it happens again so there's a series it looks at the cost burden of households um, so we pulled together all those pandemic related indicators onto one page so that people can uh, track that and as of yesterday we just launched the data about short-term rentals where you can see um, how many short-term rentals are in each community and um, find trends over time about what's been happening going back to, I think it's 2014. Thank you. Wow, so even if you're not a nerd or a geek, you will find this information fascinating. And I'm so excited about all the data we're collecting during COVID because I think it's going to give us answers to, to problems that perhaps uh, we've been struggling with. Thank you for joining us this week, and we at the Happy Hour will see you next week. Have a great weekend, everybody.